Hi everyone, my name is Elena Martinez and I'm one of the artistic directors at the Bronx Music Heritage Center. Welcome to our November edition of Percussion Discussion, where we talk about all things percussion and drum related in the Bronx and, and beyond sometimes. Um, before we get going, I just want to give a shout out to our funders. The Bronx Music Heritage Center programming is supported in part by the National Endowment for the Arts, the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of the New York State Legislature, public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council, the Lily Auchincloss Foundation, the Laurie M. Tisch Illumination Fund, and the Howard Gilman Foundation. Tonight, our program, we're really going to focus on one of our funders, um, the New York State Council on the Arts. Uh, commonly known as NISCA. NISCA is um, a, a, a funder through New York State where um, they support artists and there's a folk arts section and um, through the folk arts the folk arts section they give out folk arts apprenticeships which is um, funds that go directly to artists, master artists to work with apprentices to sort of keep to build and keep working on traditions to keep traditions going um, in, in, in different communities. And um, so this um, this past year um, we were really lucky through the Bronx Music Heritage Center and also through City Lore. Each of the organizations were able to work with um, a couple of master artists and work with them to to get apprentices, apprentice, apprentices, so they can do apprenticeships during the year. And when we, um, this one was um, really, um, I thought the two artists that were chosen for this one were really, um, I was really glad because they represent. Um, some some artists who are, aren't always represented. Um, the, the master artists that we'll be focusing on in this um, in this program are um, Norca Hernandez Nadal, who's a bomba drummer. Oh well, actually, Norca is a, I mean she's a drummer, composer, dancer, multi instrumentalist, and and actually also I've seen her dance in like four inch heels too. So she's pretty amazing at like all all components of things that are part of the um, Afro Puerto Rican genre of bomba. And, um, and it's so great to have a woman artist represented as a master artist because so many times we see, um, you know, so many of the, the grants given out are for men in a lot of these positions. So it's really great to have Norca as the master artist um, transmitting the tradition forward. And what's also great too is this week we're also celebrating um, the South Bronx Folk Festival sponsored by Danza Fiesta. And their focus this, this, um, this year is on women in the folk arts, especially the Puerto Rican folk arts. And, um, and what's also good is that this month, November, is Puerto Rican Heritage Month. So the two um, artists and the and the genres of music that they're promoting, to, uh, talking about today, um, are Puerto Rican genres of bomba. And so the other artist, the other um, master artist we have with us today is Joe Santiago, and he is a master craftsman of making drums. And what's also great about having Joe on here is that. Um, a lot of times, a lot of the artists we get to see getting grants and getting funded are artists in the performing arts, musicians and dancers. But when we think of all these genres, um, there's a lot of people who, who support the music and the dance. There's the people who make the costumes. There's the people who make the instruments. And a lot of times, these other, these other um, components don't always get um, you know, recognized as much. And also, they're the, they're the visual component of these genres. So, the, so it's great to see something in the visual arts getting, getting recognized. So, we want to welcome today um, Norca and Joe, and with them, um, Norca's apprentice is George Oliveras, and Joe's um, apprentice unfortunately couldn't be here because of a family emergency, Nelson Seda, but Nelson will be with us in spirit because we have a lot of video of him and photos he sent of his work the past year with Joe, so um, we're going to see we're going to see how his work progressed through the year. And so to start off the, the conversation, um, when we think of an apprenticeship, too, some things, the, one of the things that NISCA has for these apprenticeship programs is that it's not just about teaching anyone, just teaching any person in this genre. The, appre the, the apprenticeship grant is specifically to help people who already have a foundation in the genre where they come from. They, they have some foundation and they just need that one-on-one -on -one work with a master artist to sort of like get to that next level. And then hopefully they'll be ready for that level soon where they'll be transmitting and keeping the, the, um, the art forward and the, the, the tradition forward, so passing it along forward. So, um, so the one thing I wanna start off with first is just asking Norca and Joe themselves, if they can just give a little background about how they themselves got into their fields. Um, I'm gonna let Joe go first. <laughs> you want to go first? How did I get into bomba or got into my field? Into the um, yeah, yeah, the making, the, the, the craftsmanship of making, of working with wood and making drums. Uh, well, I was always into the drum since I was a kid, small guy. 
and the drum always uh, pulled me in, and I was always attracted to it. And uh, I had Jay Barrick from Skin on Skin. He made all my drums, conga drums and whatnot, and made my bomba drums. And then uh, I worked with him a, a little bit when uh, he was moving the shop. He had to get out of the building. He had the bond bread factory over on Atlantic Avenue in Albany. And he had to move the shop upstate. He was moving the shop. So I worked with him uh, the last, his last year there and helped him move the shop upstate. So with Jay, I was able to, uh, I got exposed into how he makes his drums and, uh, and so forth. And then when I got into the Bomba uh, folkloric, I had a, a, a Jose Ortiz, Dr. Drum, bring me some barrels one day. And he told me, Joe, uh, you think this will make a good drum? And uh, they were feta cheese barrels. I said, yeah, the wood is good, yes. except they were small. They were like 20 inches high and so forth. So uh, that's how I started, you know, got, got into drum making. And, uh, and then my wife went and got uh, the barrel mill out in Minnesota. She's going online and I got some uh, white oak display barrels and they were the right size. To, to make bomba drums out of. And from there, it just kept snowballing and it, you know, getting bigger and bigger. And so that's where I'm at today, you know, trial and error and so forth. Can you talk a little bit about um, the, when, when we think of the drums that were originally made on the island, um, what, what were they? Um, what was the wood used? Um, were they specialty drums or anything? Barrels, I'm sorry, barrels. I was at Boys Harbor one, you know, taking classes there with, you know, uh, drum classes and they had on display an old bomba drum and it was on display and it was old you could see daylight through the stays and whatnot but i said boy wow, that uh, you know it was interesting when i looked at it but the drums were made usually out of uh, uh rum barrels you know oak white oak barrels uh wine barrels whiskey barrels and that's what they were originally made out of you know what i mean they would get the big barrels the guys would cut them up make them small you know, to the bomba drum size and whatnot. The bomba drum goes from anywhere from a 24 inch, 22, 23, 24, 25, up to 27 inches, you know, in height, depending. And uh, that's that's uh, the, the size. They run anywhere in diameter from 12 to 15, 16, 17 inch diameters and so forth. You know? Now, when you make them, when you make them different sizes, is that like a personal thing that the drummer wants it? Or is there a special thing that a, Primero drum has to be a certain size, you know, or, or something like that, or are there personal things that are taken into account? The... Well, I make them 24 inches high. Sometimes I get a, a request, somebody wants a little higher drum because they're a taller person and they'll make them, you know, they want it 25, 26, up to 27 inches high and so forth. But, um, and, uh, but I seen I take Nelson Setter, for instance, he's a, uh, He's a tall guy and he plays a 24 inch drum, no problem. So, you know, it all depends on the, on the person, you know, some, I, I made a 27 inch drum for somebody a year later, he tells me, can I cut an inch off? <laughs> Cause it was, it was too high for him, you know, <laughs> but that's what he wanted originally. And, you know, so, you know, it all depends on the individual. You mean? Thank you, Joe. So, Norka, can you talk a little bit about your entry into the world of bomba and through the different components of it? Um, family. That's just basically it. You know, um, in the in the backyard of my my grandmother's house, I grew up in. I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. Um, you know, spend a lot of time in the island, and then you know, spend some time you know living in Miami. And back to Puerto Rico, and then here in New York. Um, so, but I made my way back to Puerto Rico yearly a couple of times during the year. Um, and every chance that I get, even if it's just like a four day weekend, um, just to kind of like dip my my toes in the sand and, and get reconnected with family and, and what's going on in, in my home. Um, but yeah, just just basically family, blood, blood, blood family, and family that it's not by blood, but by you know, just being almost like family. Um, so that's that's pretty much my my background. 
um, aprendí, I learned from, um, I, learned, I learned how to make barriles from watching panderos, from watching my uncle. Um, and barriles, you know, the, my points of reference, uh, Ramon Alers, Don Papo Alers from Mayagüez, who's um, a barril maker. Um, my great grandfather made barriles, um, who was a curandero and had all of these different, you know, skills um, when it came, you know, to, for the world of, of bomba. Um, I never got to meet him, but, you know, I hear the stories and a lot of my songs that I write um, are about him or related to him or something that a story related to him. Um, my father was a musician. My mother was a, a, a registered nurse by, by profession. Um, um, and I work in education now, um, but music has always been a part of my, of my upbringing. My first instrument was uh, some bongos, would you believe? <laughs> was um, my first set, first grade. I was too inquieta in the classroom and, and, you know, the teacher called my mom and my dad was like, give us some bongos and that was it. <laughs> but um, um, throughout my, my years growing up, I learned, I was able to, I picked up, I, I have an ear for, for music. I pick up music pretty, pretty quickly, percussive music pretty quickly. Um, but I play uh, one wind instrument, which is the alto sax. Um, my first teacher was Mike Viñas when I was in school, when he was teaching here in the Bronx in a school near Forest by the Forest Projects. Um, I used to go to that middle school there, 184. And he was my he was my teacher back then. And interestingly enough, I wanted to play congas when I first got to his class and he didn't have any. Um, and um, then I wanted to play the, you know, the drum set and a kid had it. And he was like, we don't have any drums. And so I looked around and I said, I'll play the alto sax. And um, that's, that's how I got my, my 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 music training in that in that instrument i could still play it a little bit you know if i practice more but i don't own a <laughs> so sax anymore oh so um, we, we won't hear any sax in a in bambula um arrangement <laughs> at any time <laughs> no no i try to keep it i try to keep the music very traditional although that i that i've been known to to do some fusions with other um afro-caribbean and and um I like to fuse a, a couple of the things because they tend to match. And, you know, todos los negros somos de un mismo sitio. <laughs> so can you also talk about, too, you learned um, as, a, as a woman playing the, these genres, when we think of um, drum, a lot of percussion traditions, especially in the African diaspora, you know, we think of men playing the drums all the time. So who were your, like, um, who were your sort of, like, um, mentors to look up to that you know that to become like a woman playing a drum and, and were there other people women in your family doing doing these other parts of the you know of the of the the tradition maybe they were dancers singers um how did you become into getting into the percussion part of it in bomba too so my 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 i guess my story when it comes to that is a little bit different in my my personal experience because in my family from growing up i never uh, grew up uh, with the with the sentiment or, or or the preconceived notion that only men could play, you know, my dad was one that pretty much uh, pushed me to it, or not pushed me, but allowed me to, you know, to manifest myself, you know, in percussion as I wanted to. Um, but when it came to bomba, um, and and my dad was a plenero, um, he was not a bombero, um, but bomba, you know, from my mom's side. Um, it was something that Wei Ching, which is she's an aunt to my to my aunt, um, part of my family tree. I would see her not only singing but dancing and drumming as well, you know. And that's one of the elder um, in the family. She's been she's passed many years now, um, but as a little girl, I remember her playing. And, and when she wasn't playing, she was singing. You know, spur of the moment verses of things that were happening, a joke that happened. Um, improvisation has been something that's been really um, a skill to to have in order for us to to convey um, you know anything in, in bomba. So that also it, uh, is a skill that I that I picked up watching you know not only my, the people in my family, my blood family, but also people that are that are like family, like Maria Cristina Alfonso Mangual, which was basically like another aunt to me. Um, who recently passed away in August and who basically was like the last 
voice in Bumba um, in, in Maya West. Um, so I grew up, you know, not really having any like stigma of that sort. There are families and practitioners in Maya West that would not allow women to play, but in my in, in my patio, that was not a thing. So it, I don't, you know, um, it was only shock to me when I actually started doing Bombay in New York, which was like a culture shock for me. The whole thing of waiting in a line to wait for one person to dance so then the, ne the next person could go dance. I never saw that before until I came to New York. Um, that's, that's, that's something that, that I never experienced it. Um, and of course, you know, also, and, and, and other things, you know, I've, I've the experience even to, in today, you know, going to other places, um, of men, not allowing women to, to play bomba or plena, you know, plena specifically plena de calle, you know, as a female, it's hard to kind of like, you know, come in and, 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 you know, be with the big boys. Um, you have to kind of make your way and make sure that you, when you stand in that, in that space that you come with everything, you con mucho fuego because, you know, you're going to get chewed up and thrown to the side if you're not, if you're not, you know, uh, si no tienes la maña and, and are versatile and, you know, using your, your improvisational skills, which both in Bomba and Plena are, are a number one skill to have. So I guess even though we see a lot more women, um, really coming into the field i mean there's there's band there's groups legacy women there's all these different groups you're your group bambula and the, the, your students you have a lot of students who are women they're still um there's it's still hard right there's still there's still like it's there's times when there's some obstacles or some pushback i guess every once in a while even though you see change even though there's been great leaps forward and changes so yeah 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 there's always you know there's always um for whatever reasons you know patriarchy um machismo i don't know <laughs> whatever you want to call it they don't want to share the drum um it, it is always there's pockets of it you know um, and it's funny because here in new york back in the mid early 2000s um i did i used to do this thing um, these events called bomba women's bomba jam sessions at the time um only three uh women were known to play primo um uh, uh, a friend of mine, Julie Savale, who used to play with me along with other females at, um, with Yerba Buena, Tato Torres Yerba Buena, um, Julie Savale, right? And um, Manuela Arciniega, who has the Legacy Women now. Back in the day, they had the Yayas. She was a drummer known to play Primo. Um, and myself, you know, these were three women that, we were three women that could handle business when it came to playing Primo. And so my observation was why there aren't more women doing this, you know, and we, I would go to the casita and everything was fun and everything, but I didn't see what I used to see at home. And so I started create, I created these events to just create the space for, for women to, to be free of judgment, free of fear and be comfortable and, and hone in skills that they already had, but were maybe too scared to to do it in, in batallas like La Casita because, you know, it was full of men and, you know, testosterone and, you know, it's, it was what it was. Um, and it, funny enough, it had a backlash. Um, and I will always be grateful to Tato Torres for addressing the entire community and with, and with an email because um, I had a backlash uh, behind why men were not invited into that space. But it was specifically that, it was to create the space for women so that they can come and be you know at you know side by side by women in no way shape or form it was a challenge it was just let us hone in our skills so that we can you know partake with you and so now we have you know so many women playing in bomba and plena i'm just like in awe no that's really great and i'm glad that you're sort of like a pioneer um in that and um here in the city and um, a couple and a couple fast announcements. Um, anyone watching to the Facebook page, please put any questions you have for George, Joe, and Norca in the in the Facebook comment section, and we'll make sure the questions get to them. And then we also he's arrived, the other artistic director of the Bronx Music Heritage Center, Bobby Sanabria. So he's gonna take over some of the questions in a moment. But um, one one thing I'll just add. Um, so it's great to hear from Norca and Joe. So now like the apprentices themselves. So George, maybe you can talk a little bit. How did you get involved in Bomba and come to work with Norca as her student and, 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 and to work with her as an apprentice? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I, I've, I've always loved music since, uh, since I was a little boy. 
you know, my, uh, my grandparents used to tell me that as a two and three year old, I was already humming and singing songs. Of course, I don't remember that, but that's what they told me. So uh, uh, lyrics was actually what I was more uh, uh, inclined to do. Um, but as uh, I, I was born in Puerto Rico, came here when I was eight years old. And, uh, and, and when I first heard drum music, you know, I, I was inspired. I mean, I, I wanted I wanted to, you know, play congas and bongos, which was mainly the uh, the salsa genre, which is what I was more inclined to do at the time being. Um, but I, I never I never got to go to, to any school uh, uh, that, that would teach me that. However, uh, I, I joined the Marines uh, when I was 18 years old and there was a Puerto Rican guy that had a set of congas. So in the service, all the Latinos always, they look for each other, you know, whether you're Puerto Rican, Dominican, Colombian, uh, you know, Venezuelan, Panameños, we had all kinds of guys. So we all stuck together and somebody says, hey, this is guy that has congas in one of the barracks, let's go check him out. And we went and, uh, and I met uh, the guy uh, who today uh, uh, has his own business also called Iroko, he makes checkeres. And he also used to work with JCR making uh, uh, campanas. Anyway, uh, so he started teaching us how to play the conga, how to hit the conga. And uh, so I learned a little bit, but not so much that uh, I, I became that good at it. However, when I got out of the Marine Corps, I went to, which was 1970, the January of 79, I went to Johnny Colon's East Harlem Music School, which at that time, uh, Bobby was a, a teacher there. Remember that, Bobby? You were uh, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, what do you call it, the, the music theory teacher. And he also, uh, he led the workshop band of which uh, I joined uh, and, and I became one of the singers there. Uh, and, and so in that school, I, I kept, uh, I, there was a teacher named Skip uh, who was teaching congas and I, and I started taking congas conga classes until they brought in a teacher that uh, was a vocalist and I switched over to vocals and I kept singing on that. And, uh, and lo and behold, Johnny Colon himself uh, used me a couple of times for some of his gigs with his band uh, doing background vocals, the coros and the maraca and the guido. And, uh, and uh, with the workshop band with Bobby, that's, that's mainly what we did. We sang, or I sang, play the guido, play the maraca. And, uh, and I joined some local bands in Brooklyn. I live in Brooklyn. I joined some bands there uh, and we would gig on the weekends, but I also worked in the post office and I got married and I have three kids. So it was kind of hard juggling music and a job, you know, with a family. Uh, and I had to make a decision as to which of the two I was gonna keep because I got in trouble one time after a gig, I went to work with no sleep and, and I, and I I was in my car and I actually dozed off and I hit another car. And I said, well, this is it. You know, it's either the job or the music, but I can't do both. So I, I I'm, I'm, again, I'm married, I got kids. I had to leave the music. And, uh, but the music, of course, it never leaves me. You know, the music is in me. I, uh, uh, I, I always had my maraca, my guido. Uh, I had a conga in, the, in my basement and I was, you know, I, and I used to practice a little bit. However, uh, when I, 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 I had heard of Bombay Plena many, many years ago, of course, I was a, a child, but I had never thought about going in that route, even though I loved the music. And uh, eventually, uh, I, I retired from the post office and I went and I took a Plena class with uh, Juan, Lo Plenero de la Veintiuna. And uh, I took four classes with him, a series, and then Two months later, they had another series on Bomba, and I went and I and I took classes with Mateo Gonzalez, uh, who was the first guy that taught me, ex you know, the, the, the five basic rhythms in in the uh, in the Bomba genre. So after those four classes, I'm you know I'm I'm like in limbo. I don't have a drum. I, I you know I don't have no more classes. What do I do? And another guy from the class says, Hey, listen, there's this woman named Lorca. She teaches at El Fogón. There's a guy named Joe. He makes barriles. So come on down. And sure enough, I, I you know, I was fortunate enough to, to, to have met these people. Joe made me my first barril and Norca honed my skills at 
not just playing, but singing, writing music, uh, playing out also. And, and here we are today. And when she asked me about this apprenticeship, I, I was ecstatic. I was, I was, yes, let's do this. I, I mean, I, I, I never thought it was going to happen, but it happened. And here we are today. And I am glad that, uh, you know, I've come this far. And this is just the beginning. I mean, uh, the future with Norco looks great to me. Fantastic. George. Yes. So, and Norca, thank you so much for being here tonight. Uh, for everyone watching, uh, my apologies for being a little tardy, but New York City traffic from Manhattan. I was doing a lecture at Baruch College, and hopefully those students are watching right now. So uh, they never, uh, they know absolutely nothing about this music, but hopefully they'll learn a lot tonight. I'm going to go back. George, it's great seeing you. I remember you well in those days at the East Harlem uh, School of Music with Johnny Colon. In fact, George and myself, Johnny had gotten an abandoned building from the city for a dollar, and he he had some of us, asked some of us if we would help him clean the basement, and we were there with shovels cleaning out the basement. That was supposed to be the new location for the school, but that never happened. But I must say, with that workshop band where George was, we did quite a few performances, and I remember one very well. We did one, a performance for NBC live on uh, we taped a, a show, uh, a public access, a public affairs show called Visiones, which I still b I believe is on, it airs on Sunday mornings for NBC. And uh, Paul Rodriguez, the great Chicano comedian, it was his first appearance ever on TV. And we performed there uh, for the, uh, uh, as guests as well on that TV show. And George was there singing. And what he, he exactly what he said, play maracas, guiro, clave, whatever was needed, and then singing, sometimes lead, sometimes background vocal. And he basically looks the same, <laughs> 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 which is a great thing, man. It's, a great thing. it's always a good thing. It's good to see you. Uh, uh, Joe, I have a personal connection to Joe because he made me uh, my barril, my, my own personal drum, those beautiful drums that you see in the back. And we'll talk about his craftsmanship in a minute. But I just wanted to ask Norca, who's a good friend, and we have so much respect for her in our community. And I'm glad you talked about some of the pitfalls that you had in the beginning, because it's not always an easy road, especially for women in the music industry, and particularly our our our, our, our Latino society, which is very macho oriented. But slowly but surely, because of people like yourself, that's changing. The Primo drum, for those of you who don't know, she was talking a little bit about the Primo. It's the solo drum, the drum that speaks in the Bomba tradition and must follow the dancers and mark with them. So it's a dialogue. But the Primo drum is is usually the most experienced drummer. It's the master drummer, really, in, in the tradition. I wanted to ask you, did you actually uh, study Primo with anyone or did you just... Uh, were well, you self-taught on it by watching other drummers that, you, that from your childhood or being here in New York City? I'm curious about that. So the way I came up to be able to sit at that drum was inherited. Mm -hmm. um, so very traditional. Um, once my uncle and the family, Juan Nadal, passes away a few years back, um, I am the next in line. And wow. so... That's how I inherited, and he, along with other people in my family, um, you know, that that play are my points of of, of reference, you know. Um, so now I have my nephew in in Puerto Rico, two of my nephews um, that play, and um, one likes to play the primo, the other one, the the oldest one, um, Ryan, he likes to be a buleador expert at at primo as well, but he prefers to be Abuleo, he says that, you know, it's important, important to have strong, you know, um, support foundation in Buleo. And, and so he sticks to the Buleo. The little one, the youngest one, he, they're not little, they're 18 and above. Um, the youngest one, Adriel, is my, also my godson, he's the one that plays the primo. And in essence, I, you know, I, every time I, we have the chance and I go to Puerto Rico, I, I want him to be the one playing because you know for me i want him to be able to 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 practice it and and, and be able to 
to hone in his skills. They've studied music as well, but um, I myself am still studying. This is a life uh, long journey of learning all the instruments that you learn every day. Um, so, me defiendo en, en el primo. Me defiendo. I, I'm not. I'm. I don't consider myself a master, but you know, if I if I'm challenged, I step up. Well, I would I would disagree with you uh, <laughs> because I've seen, I've been witness to Norca's not only beautiful playing but also her artful dancing as well. You got to really check her out when she dances. But uh, so, I, would me, describe, Bob, I would describe her in one word: uh, fierce. You know, on, on both dancing and drumming and singing as well. Excuse me, Bobby. So um, we just talked to George about his um, apprentice, um, getting involved in the, being an apprentice to Norca. And we also, we do have a lot of questions. We'll get to them in a few minutes. We have a lot of questions um, in Facebook. But maybe we can go back to Joe, since George talked a little bit about him getting involved with Norca as, as you know, as a student. Can Joe, can you maybe talk about um, Nelson's um, pro and his process as an apprentice? And maybe we can put up the, um, we have a PowerPoint of a lot of um, photos that Nelson, of Nelson d doing the work with Joe during this past year. So maybe you can talk a little bit about how Nelson came to the apprenticeship with you, and then we can go through the process and see the photos of the whole of him making his own drum with you. Okay. Well, um, with Nelson, uh, I knew him from uh, the folkloric, and uh, I knew he was a bombero. He, 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 he drummed, and he sang, and he danced a little, and uh, and he even made some drums, or he toyed with them. He would call me and ask me for advice, and I would, you know, tell him what's what, what he would ask me about. And to me, when this came up, when I was presented with this uh, this master apprentice, I thought he'd be the ideal person to uh, to you know to work with and whatnot. I knew his heart was in it, and he was a humble guy and a talented guy in many phases of the folkloric. So that's how uh, we came to be. Yeah. And over here in the shop, what he's doing here, I was showing him prepping the the barit for gluing. And here he is with uh, his butcher apron on there, so he don't get glue on his clothes. And he was uh, gluing up the stays. And this is after we prepped them for gluing and uh, preparing them to assemble the drum. Next. Joe, if I may ask real yeah. quick, where, where do you actually get the staves? Like, where do you get the material that, that you that you use to make the drum? Well, what I do is I get the barrels. I get I get them from the barrel maker. And uh, the first barrels I got were out, you know, uh, display barrels. And then uh, in Long Island, the news, I think it was Newsday, Long Island Newsday, uh, they called me up one day and asked me would I be open to do a, a show of Masters of Long Island, you know? And uh, they, they said, they saw my area code on the phone was 516. So good thing I did that because uh, they said, well, you're the only drum maker in Long Island. So I said, all right. So I, I was open, I went along with it. And uh, they also had a barrel maker, a guy named George from Romania. And he mm. was out in Medford in Long Island, Suffolk County. So when I saw the article that came out and I saw him, I said, wow, I got a barrel maker right in my backyard. <laughs> so I went out to see him and uh, he remembered me from the article and he liked, I bought a drum I, I made and he liked it and he offered to help me any way he can. And he basically, I get the wood, the barrels from the barrel maker and I asked George to make me some custom barrels. This is what I wanted. This is what I didn't want on them and so forth. And he agreed to do that for me. So for the last few years, he's been making my custom barrels. You know, so I asked him what I want. This is how I get it. And, and he's been obliging me. And unfortunately, he just moved the whole operation out to Pennsylvania. So I lost them. You know, when we're talking about when we're talking and when we talking about barrels for those of you, uh, uh, our audience viewing this, when we're talking about barrels, these are barrels that would normally you be used on farms, etc., to to store away anything from cheese to to dry goods, or anything like that. That's what we're talking about, right? Yes. And wineries. Yes, yeah. yes. And wineries and, as well. Yeah. And, and and the wood they use in the barrels, when the barrel makers, it's, it's a closed thing. They keep their secrets to themselves, and basically, when they make a barrel, the barrel usually lasts 
25 to 30 years, mm. you know, and uh, they'll repair them, they crack them, they'll move, remove the stays and repair them and so forth. But they use the wood they use in there is quarter sown white oak, mm. which is an expensive cut. And uh, it's good. When they make the bower, they don't glue them. They just put them together. The hoops or the loop, uh, the bands is what hold them together. And when they put the liquid in there, whether it be rum, wine, or whiskey, whatever it is, it will swell up and seal the barrels. Mm. So it's it it that kind of wood is great also for sound. So you know, like they say, uh, you know, they, people make bomba drums. So I tell people there's a difference between a bomba drum and a barri. The wood is the main thing. And nothing sounds like a barri. So if, if if you're looking, you know, for the sound, white oak is the loudest. I have also make red oak barrels. And I asked George, the barrel maker, what's the difference between the red and the white? He says the grains. The grains in the white oak are tighter. And the grains in the red oak are a little more looser. Yeah. And, 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 and like when I was working with Jay, uh, he would make drums out of cherry wood, white oak, and ashwood mm. and so forth so those are the the woods they use and they you know you get exotic wood mahogany this other stuff but here you know i just work with the white oak and the red oak fantastic when you mentioned jay we're talking about jay barrick from skin on skin in brooklyn new york for those of the, the viewers yeah. who don't know who jay is let's go to the next slide next okay uh all right so now we're looking at him gluing the stay. Now the photo to the right is the drum after it's been glued. All right, he took the stays off, or rather he took the bands off. <laughs> so this is what the barrel looks like after it's been glued and dried. And he's working on uh, the inside, cleaning it up a little bit and the outside cleaning it up after the glue job. We let it, we let it dry for about three or four days. Do you do anything to the inside of the drum to give it any more resonance at all or to protect it like using polyurethane or anything like that do you do anything like that any special well treatment? yeah you can uh well when you glue the barrel up the inside the stays are some some stays are different thicknesses from the others so what i like to do is even it out and we take care sometimes the barrels are charred if you buy a barrel that's been used and a used barrel they char the inside. There are three stages of charring the inside of the barrel for flavor for the whatever they put in it, rum, whiskey, whatever. And uh, the third charging is usually they blisters the wood. And what happens when the wood blisters on the inside, that also traps the sound. So what I like to do is clean them up on the inside, sand them down. If I got to glass it, smooth it out, I'll do that. And even the stays. So Nowhere can the sound get trapped or, you know, in there. And, and on the high-end barrels, the, like the performance barrels, I, uh, I finish the inside as good as the outside. So it's a little more work, but also you get a, a, a better sound. Fantastic. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, here, uh, those are the, those brushes you see on the left and the cup, that's the glass resin, fiberglass resin. That's basically most of the brushes you use. You throw them away after you use the glass because it hardens up. So that shows you how many brushes you use in the process of glassing the edges of the drum. Mm. And that's what George is doing here. I mean, uh, Nelson's doing here. He's, uh, you can see one end is wet and he's got the other end. I like to glass the ends of the drum for the simple reason that uh, it, it, it tunes better, it holds the drum together better, and it keeps it from coming apart. And also it's like an ama, like the, Jay used to use a metal one, but the metal one expands and contracts at different temperatures than the wood. And sometimes if you use a metal ama inside the drum to keep them going around, it will crack the drum if the temperature difference is, 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 a, is extreme. So I use the fiberglass, and uh, it, it more or less moves with the drum better and it won't crack the drum out. And you get a better sound also. What Joe is talking about, for those of you who play congas or have custom-made wooden conga drums, the alma is a round piece of metal 
that hold that is basically inside the drum near the near the where the head is to keep the drum round and you know because that takes a, the drum itself when you play it it constantly takes a lot of pressure etc and impact and all that but this is fascinating to me with this technique uh with uh with this uh technique that you're using would it work for a conga drum as well instead of using a round metal alma or the what well, alma is soul you know so yeah. me metaphorically speaking yes it, i i've done conga repairs where they're cracked out mm -hmm. after repairing the cracks and so forth i reinforce it with the fiberglass and uh and a matter of fact a, f a few guys i i did their repairs and they took it back to the to play and the people they play with wanted to buy the drum because it sounded completely different you know i call it i call it like tuning up the drum mm -hmm. you know so and and it, it works pretty good so would you would you uh I, I i'm just learning about this technique would you like if you made conga drums uh, would you do this as well in, in your process or would you use a metal alma? Uh, uh, okay, no, what, how I got to do this was I used to work in aircraft and I, and that's where I learned the fiberglassing. We used to repair the nose on all the planes. That's all honeycomb fiberglass mm. and they get bird strikes. So they come into the shop diamond, we, we will repair them. So that's where I learned how to work with fiberglass. But what I do drums that come into the shop and they need repair i noticed that they all start cracking from the bottom or the top mm -hmm. the bottom because they get banged around a lot and that's where they'll start cracking the top because a lot of times they'll skin them so much they'll put another wet skin on it and the skins themselves they're processed with chemicals and when you put a wet skin on the end of a drum and it's wood it starts eating away at that glue mm -hmm. and that's where it starts you know, opening up on the on the on, on the end. So, by glassing them, that keeps this from happening. You know, and and it lasts longer. It tunes better. The skin lasts longer, and uh, and it works. So far, I haven't had a a drum come back to me yet. Fantastic. Well, I'm sure there's some drum makers out there watching this now, and they're salivating, <laughs> probably to use your your technique. But at least we know where it came from first. Yeah. yeah. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, this is a up close shot of the inside of the drum, the fiberglass matting, and uh, George is giving it. Uh, I mean, George uh, Nelson is giving it a, a a cut. You can see on the side of the drum how it's tuned. Also, the edges, and it's been sanded. The outside has been sanded. The inside has been sanded. And this is uh, putting uh, the first layers of the glass glassing procedure. Mm -hmm. Go to the next slide. Okay. Uh, the tools on the left is for hammering the, the bands on, you know, the hoops on the drum. But if you look at the, what he's doing on the right, he's hammering the, the hooks. In other words, you'll see later on in one of the other slides where he's heating it up. You heat the hook up or the or the rod, 516 rod, and then you hammer it flat to go over, like Pandero started, go over the tuning ring. And here he is uh, applying the the hammer to it. So you, you're describing what, we, what many of us would call the tuning lugs, the making of the tuning lugs. Yes, the lugs. That's another word for, for the hooks, the lugs. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, here we're raising up the drum that the, like the the coopers or the barrel makers call it. So we're getting ready to start gluing up the stays and assembling the the, the drum. So we're setting up the the frame for it, the hoops. Okay, next slide. Okay, and this procedure here is the layout of the plates on the on the shell of the drum. And basically the do's and don'ts, uh, sometimes the, <laughs> the don'ts, yeah, if you don't know what to do, sometimes knowing what not to do is just as important. So here he spent, uh, 
he was a little frustrated because he spent most of the day trying to lay out the plates. And the, what you don't do is you put you don't put the plates on the seam of the drum. In other words, the stays. You have to avoid that. So here he's trying to figure it out. He did this half the morning trying to figure out keep you know evenly spaced around and not hit the seams. Right. So. right. Now, Joe, uh, before we go to the next slide, you told us that you had a, a background in, in aircraft repair, maintenance, etc. Where did you learn this? Were you in the military or outside? Oh, no, I, I went to aviation high school. I went in there Queens. and, and Queens, graduated yeah. with honors. I graduated with my government license. And, uh, and then I went to work for Lockheed Aircraft at, uh, at uh, Kennedy Airport and, uh, and at, at they approached me and wanted to know if I wanted to be what I, what I consider inspection department. <laughs> so I was laughing and, you know, they were serious and they said, what's so funny? So I said, yeah, here's this kid out of high school, you know what I mean? And they're going to put me in inspection department, inspecting the work of these guys who've been in the industry 25, 30 years. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but it, it, it didn't happen. <laughs> Well, aviation high school, my cousin, uh, Junie went to aviation. I remember him. He's older than me, but I remember him when I was a little kid, he'd be bringing these models, yes. with model planes and this, that, and showing me that I go, wow, this is very serious, man. It's like, you know, yeah. it's, it's no joke. So it was so glad that you went to such a prestigious place and that, uh, you know, now you're part of our artistic community. When did you start? When did you get the idea to start making, uh, instruments? Well, you know, in, in aviation, you go to different shops and each shop you go to, you, you make something and what you make in that shop, you're going to use in the next shop. So you were making tools, you were making uh, sheet metal, woodworking, uh, a machine shop, welding. So all these skills that you learn, you, you know, at the end, when you finally graduate, you basically you know, you could build an airplane if you had the material. Right. So a lot of this stuff that I learned there, and while I was attending these shops, I always said, you know, one day I like to have my own shop because I like this stuff, you know, working with my hands and whatnot. And what I put in these barriles, a lot of it comes from aviation, you know, the, the shops I attended at aviation and so forth. Fantastic. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, now here is the, 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 the height of the plate from the top of the drum. That's important also, you know. Uh, since we make our own metal work, we can set it up in the hooks wherever you, you know, at the height we want. I've made short hooks or lugs, depending on the drum, and positioning the plate from the top of the drum coming down. So his, he's, he's doing that right now in this photo. And then... Uh, where the holes are going to go to hold the plates in. Great. Next slide. Okay. On the left, uh, this all two, these two photos, it shows the band or the hoops, they call it. This is on the bottom of the drum. Uh, this is after it's been fiberglass and whatnot. So on the left, I'm sure he, what we're doing here is we're hammering out the band. You do it by hand. You could use a shrinker stretcher, but I like to use a, the hammer. I so I hammer it out. This is something that Jay Berwick showed me uh, from Skin on Skin. And what I, and I made some tools to make it, uh, to be able to facilitate this mm -hmm. and so forth. So that's me hammering out the band. And then this is the band on the bottom of the drum. Next slide. All right, the, on the left is the plates. Those are the, the ones he, he cut out out of a piece of, in the middle, you can see the, it's a three quarters by uh, one eighth plate steel and the layout work on it. And then on the side after he cut them and so forth. Now the tool on the right is something I made up to make the, the loop where the hook goes through which is going to be welded to the plate. 
So that's something, you know, a tool that I made on the fly because, uh, you know, there's got to be an easier way of doing this, and I made that. <laughs> So when you make the loop, you're talking about the thing, you have the side plate that yeah, is next right. to the drum and then that loop where the yeah. actual tuning lug goes through that loop. You know? Right. Okay. So that's the tool I made for make, making that. You know what I mean? Do, do you have it patented? I hope you got it patented. Man. Nah, I haven't patented it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I made like two or three of those. <laughs> okay, let's go to the next slide. There's the hoop. Yeah, that's what we were just talking about. Okay, there, you can see the hoop there, the U. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, on, the, on those now, when he made the plates, he wanted to be able to countersink the hardware. So he didn't want it sticking out. So instead of using 1 8 plate steel, we used 3 16 So he needed a thicker plate so he can countersink it and it gives it room for the, the screw to go in. When you say uh, the term, when you use the term countersink, what do you mean? Well, you see on the holes on the plates, right? You see like a little halo around them. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you take a flat screw, like a wood screw, and you screw it in. It would it would be flush with the top of the plate. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's countersinking. Great. They use that a lot in aircraft, and he wanted to make his plates like that. So I said, okay. So we went that route. Fantastic. And those are the hooks he made on the right. When he was hammering it before, you heat it, you hammer it, and you, then you bend it. And uh, so those are the hooks he made. Okay, next slide. Okay, now the one on the left with the, with the gloves on, that's a plate that he's cleaning off the edges. He's, he's smoothing them out. So, you know, they don't cut you anything. The one in the middle is the torch. He's uh, heating up the rod that he's gonna make a, uh, bend the hook over the lug. So you bend it, you heat it up and bend it and it won't crack on you. Mm -hmm. And the one on the right, he's welding the plate. He's welding the U onto the plate. So that's him welding uh, uh, on, on the machine. That was the most frustrating for him, the welding. He, you know, I told him, listen, it, it's going to take some practice to really get good at it. So, you know, but that that's basically him in the shop. So you got like a, it, it, your shop is like Dr. Frankenstein's lair, man. You know, it's, like, <laughs> it's, it's fully equipped. Fantastic. Next slide, next slide. Okay, this is after the, let me see, this is... The band. He's taking off the bands. Before you took the bands off. Yeah, this is the bands. This is the barrel. I'm not sure. Let me see. Yeah, he's removing the bands. After glue. It's backwards. That's is it backwards? Yeah. yeah. This is I, the removal of the bands. Yeah, this is after he glued it up. And he's getting ready to... In other words, the barrel's already glued. It's been sitting a few days. And now he's ready to take off the the bands to start working on it, cleaning it up, and 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 take it from there. So, how many days would you leave it to dry? Depending on the weather. Mm. I mean, uh, depending on the weather, you know, the cold weather it, it takes a lot. It increases it like almost three, four times the length. But you let it you let it dry out. You know when it's ready to go. Yeah, sometimes the bands they'll fall off or sometimes the the glue completely dries you know what i mean mm -hmm. so I, I give it three four days in warm weather hot weather mm -hmm. and you don't want to leave it in the sun the sun will dry up the wood you know what i mean so you want to you want to keep it in cool dry place let it let so it cure. you want to let it you want to let it I, I would say like cure naturally like in other words you wouldn't want to speed up the process by like using no, a blow dryer no, or anything yeah. like that yeah because what you do on that, it's like, uh, you know, it, it starts affecting the wood. Right. You know what I mean? You, okay. so you let it, you, you give it time to dry. You know what I mean? Okay, next slide. So um, it looks like that's the, end of the, that's the end of the images from Nelson. So now I want to get into, um, we have a bunch of videos that show 
um, Nelson's drum at work, his, his final, his finished drum, completed drum at work, but also with George um, performing and, and s singing some of the songs that he composed. So maybe we can get into some of the videos and then we will get into some of the questions from the, from the Facebook comments section. So um, do you, um, George and Norka, do you wanna set up some of these videos that we can show? Sure. You want to, um, so the the first song is being sang by um, Nelson, um, which is Otto no los barriles, um, and um, and then the second video is a song composed by Jorge, which is uh, called Africano. Africano. And uh, in the in the rhythm <clears throat> of in the rhythm of Juba. And the third song is Borracho y Pelao in the rhythm of Sika. Also on the first song where Nelson is gonna be singing and playing the qua, I will be playing the primo drum. That primo drum, by the way, Nelson had just finished making it, which is the one that was on the photos, and we played it that night uh, for the first time. And in the first song that you're gonna do in the video, what rhythm is it in terms of the bomba? That's going to be, uh, no, that was a uh, Gracima de Santurce. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. Oh, no, no. For demonstration purposes, we we kept uh, we had the drummers, vocalists, just sing shortly. But of course, uh, when you're watching something like that, you want to get up and dance, and you know you want it to be last longer. But uh, in any case, let's uh, go to the next performance. Okay. Africano.
Fantastic, fantastic. Hey, while Jorge right. is getting the next, while Jorge is getting the next um, video ready, let me take. Maybe we can take a couple questions. Um, from Yasmin Morales Vicente, George, what has been the most rewarding part of the apprenticeship for you? Oh my God, <laughs> it's it's hard. It's hard to describe. I mean, it, it, I, I love everything about it. I mean, uh, I guess I I'm geared more towards the drumming, but I mean, uh, you know, I, I play the mara. I, you know, I learned the qua, I learned the maraca, and of course the singing. Uh, so everything is rewarding. I mean, this is this is. You know, I, it's hard to pinpoint one area, but I, I think that I, I, uh, I focus more on the drumming because I, I wanted to learn the drumming so badly that that's what I concentrated on. But of course, the writing, uh, the music and the singing, which Norka helps me out a lot on, uh, that's that's I would say that's my se my second best thing that I do uh, as far as the, the whole thing is concerned. But yeah, a good question. <laughs> Hard I must I must say that the, the composition that you wrote, uh, Africano, Español uh, Taino, it, it speaks to the the multiculturalism of what we are as Puerto Ricanos. All of us doesn't matter how light skinned or dark skinned you are. We those three cultures make up what we are. And you exactly. said it beautifully there in a very concise way. You know, our, our culture, our music is always about telling the truth, and you told it beautifully there. And I must say, the most rewarding part for me of George's apprenticeship is this beautiful qua <laughs> that George made for me. <laughs> Thank been, you for showing it. <laughs> that I've been using ass assiduously a lot. And he, he makes this beautiful, these beautiful stands for it. So you could play standing up and he has a shorter one that he makes that you, so you could play sitting down as well. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. So another question. Oh, sorry. But it's important to, 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 to say that traditionally that is a modern setup for Bomba. Uh, traditionally, the qua is, is the two sticks that are, that are, were traditionally played on the side of the drum. You know, like kneel, knelt, that you had to kneel down by the drum or sit in the back, you know, of the the drummer in the southern style that they play. You know, like straddling the drum and and play the the qua on the drum itself. But this is is part of the evolution of bomba, um, this setup here that Bobby has. Yeah, and of course, uh, I I play the drum set, so I've I've, I've adapted mm -hmm. those rhythms to playing on adapting these styles to the drum set as well, which we're going to talk about in a future percussion discussion uh, coming up. But George is, uh, uh, Joe, you must be very proud of George as well as you are, you know, of Nelson. So there you go. So yeah. what, one other question then, um, before we get to the video, the next video, Yasmin again asked the question, Norka, who are the women in Bomba Plena that you look up to? Oh, as I mentioned earlier, um, they're growing up. Um, that the Awiching, um, who I learned um, a lot of songs from, or considered traditional songs, um, uh, learning um, the improvisational skills. My, my dad told me how to improvise. Um, so he's my, my first teacher when it comes to the, the skill of improvisation. My, my dad and I would go on walks. And, and he would start a sentence and I would have to finish it. We had to rhyme, you know? Um, so he taught me how to how to improvise, and then you know also learning from my points of reference, the Awiching again, um, and and also the 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 skill of saying um, some people we would say canting flial, you know we would say many things, but not say anything at all, you know, or use the metaphors to to say certain things, you know, to papuya, um, you know, throw shade. Um, or, or you know, to challenge somebody to say something, you know, uh, that may be a, a, a lascivious in some ways, not too direct. Um, that's all. That's also a skill. Kriti Mangual, also uh, someone that I that I saw from very very small. She practically is like was like an aunt to me. Um, so she's also um, a point of reference. My grandmother, my aunt, um, who um, partly raised me, Gandhi, who lives in Puerto Rico, also is an exceptional um, uh, uh, 
and she improvises to the drop of anything, you know? And those are the, the same way I learned growing up is the same way that I teach um, here at, at Bomba Works. I apply the same, the same um, set of, of tools to get the students to kind of like get their pencil going and, and use the muse. Thank you. So let's go on to the next video. Did we set this one up already? Or we know what we're gonna see? Yeah, the, the last uh, song um, by Jorge, yeah, another one of my inspirations, uh, uh, more on the comical side, uh, Borracho y Pelao, you know, uh, uh, talks about the, you know, how some of us go out on a Friday night after work, get drunk and be broke the next day. And just in time for Thanksgiving and the Christmas season. <laughs> Viene yo con el teque Before we go on, before we go on, excuse me, Elena. Uh, before we go on, can you introduce the other uh, yeah. performers? Yeah, I wanted I wanted to to interject and, and say I wanted to give a shout out the the females in the background the, um, uh, with the maraca, Charisse uh, Rivera, um, the the other woman next to her, um, uh, Brunilda Morraval, and Onqua Aris Castillo, all students of Bumba Works. Fantastic. The other thing I wanted to ask you, Norka, real quick, because this is always a thing that's fascinated me, uh, and uh, I promised myself I would ask you this question. Why the tradition of just the soul maraca? It seems like it's like the only tradition in the Caribbean that just uses our tradition of the bomba. It just uses one maraca. People have asked me over there, hey, how come, what happened to the other maraca? <laughs> I said, I go, I know somebody that can answer that. And, and that's why I'm asking you, why that I, tradition of the soul maraca? I would, I would first say, um, you know what? I don't know. Um, <laughs> Good answer, because that's what I said. <laughs> you know, um, but, but I find that, you know, um, as a student, a life student of Bomba, you know, I ask the same questions and, and read different, you know, uh, things that have been written about Bomba and also take into, you know, consideration the, the history of the people that make us today, you know, and the differences and, you know, like we've talked in the, in, in different occasions at different panels, how the, the pandero drum made its way all the way to the island of Puerto Rico. We mentioned that, you know, in, in a previous um, panel discussion. So I would say that this is just, you know, mainly an inheritance from uh, the people that were here before us you know, the, the different um, people that 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 practice um, the many rhythms that require some sort of, you know, uh, shekere, maraca situation that the Arawak people used it. Um, they used one, they used two. Um, I would say, you know, again, I really don't know why we have 
one maraca in bomba what i do know is what i do know is that the person that sings is the person that uses the maraca for the most part um it was how i i was i was brought up and what i saw in my in my patio i know that that's a fact for for me um not necessarily in a lot of other places in a lot of different regions but i would say that it's just you know it could have been two at one point you never know um and then you know just like the situation with the qua you know who wants to be kneeling down by a drum in Gumbate the whole night we got to make it more you know it went from <laughs> using a bamboo stick in between the legs to what you have next to you there bobby so right. it might have been you know uh something about evolution more comfort or anything you know there's some other areas in puerto rico where they have have added uh, a guira to bomba right so who's to say that you know that wasn't there before and it's part of of something that evolved for the sound you know and they substituted the maraca for 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 the guira or have the guira and the maraca so right i i really don't know why we play one but i do know that mm -hmm. his singer who <laughs> who should have have it at least for me in my experience in my in my family and of course if you want to hear bomba as it was adapted first uh particularly the sika to band performance we got to go to rafael cortijo with his band who with his group he adapted those rhythms to afro-cuban percussion the congas the timbales and the lone sencero the cowbell so there's videos of that band doing that so you can check out on youtube and that's the same rhythms but adapted to a to a different style of percussion was when we adapt these rhythms sometimes the band performance the they they interpret it but using different percussion instruments but the essence of them still remains the same and there you can see the the, the two barrels there the the subidor or the primo and the buleador or seguidor and you can see the qua which is the two sticks and what used to be a plate uh, used to be a plate on a whiskey barrel you know an empty whiskey barrel and now we have this instrument that's you know th those are the types of sticks we use kind of very large almost like timbala sticks but just larger now i think there's one more video to show jorge Vasquez. jorge vasquez is there one, there's one more right Great. So even though um, Nelson wasn't here with us today, we got to see him, how he made his drum and performing with the drum. So um, I wanted, there's a few questions I want to um, get to from people who are on Facebook. Um, this is, I guess, for anyone, any of you guys there. Um, Iris Diaz asked, what care do you recommend for maintenance on bariles, especially when you live in areas of extreme temperature changes, like cold places like Chicago? How do you care for the wooden skin, the wood and the skin? This is Evie. It is, yes. Yep. Love you, Ivelis Diaz from Bombera, from Escuela Bombera de Corazón in Chicago. All right. That would, the cold weather. When the cold weather, uh, the shell itself, you, you don't want to put it by any heat. You know, keep it in a cool, dry place. Uh, the skin, you tune it down after you finish using it. You tune it up, always tune the skin down because if it's snowing, raining, the humidity causes it to absorb water. On a hot day, 
the skin will tighten up. So pay attention to it. If it's too tight, loosen it up, a, you know, a little bit. As far as maintenance on the skin, I use a, a hand slob, like for chopped hands. You can use cocoa butter, uh, but I, I use this stuff uh, for the chopped hands. Uh, Burt makes it. It's a little yellow tin. You rub that on the skin every so often. As far as the hardware goes, the hardware you have should last you the life of that drum. But what happens, a lot of people don't oil them. They don't oil the lungs. And be careful what you use to oil the lungs. The simplest thing to do is you take each lug, loosen one at a time, you know, loosen it up, take a drop of three and one oil, drop it into the threads, bring it back up, snug it, and you you do that every two or three months, the lugs should last That's you a lifetime. a lifetime. And don't stack washers on the lugs. Some people do it, they run out of threads, they start stacking the washers on. And what that does is strips the threads. It kills it. Okay. Use a hard, hardened washer, number eight auto washer. That keeps it from galling. Galling is when metal to metal, they start shaving into each other. Then you can't tighten it up anymore. So use a hard, one hard washer and oil the threads. And count, and and count yeah. also so the skin yeah. doesn't shift. How many, yeah. how many times Righty you get tidy. It? You bring it around to the right, you loosen it to the left, you know? Some people crank double, triple, just do one at a time, go around it. And the skin, the goat skin doesn't require that many turns like a conga does or cow skin. And it's very thin, it's very sensitive, so you don't need that much tightening on it. So yeah, nice and easy. I meant to ask you, where do you get your skin? supply of uh, uh the skins i get are from the ivory coast ivory coast goat skins i get them there's a guy he just retired shorty palmer i used to get my skins from shorty palmer <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean? and uh and and uh, some of the solid shells i i make i used to get the shells also from from shorty so we have a few more questions and i would um george joe and norka when you get a chance check the facebook comments you have a lot of people friends of yours who are making a lot of comments to you guys but um another question we have from yasmin morales vicente joe have have the preferences of the customers changed over time do the older bomba musicians have different preferences than the younger ones and how the drums are made well when i started making the drums uh the people you know, the, the, the workmanship, like when I make the drum, I make it like if it's for me. And uh, a lot of times, you know, I start making a drum, the drum tells me when it's done. And I look at it, I finish it, I say, well, there's nothing else I can do to this thing. It's finished. And it, really the preference hasn't changed. What changes is somebody wants to stain red, someone to look like mahogany, uh, you know, little things like that. But basically, I make every drum the, you know, the same. Uh, to me, every drum I make is my masterpiece. Mm -hmm. Great. So it's, so it's more of an aesthetic thing in terms of the staining and all that kind of stuff. Yes, people don't want this or that. I mean, I made my personal drums. I I, I call them, I, I pimp them out or blink. You put a little bling in them. I take the hardware and I haven't played it. Mm -hmm. I had one plated chrome. I had another one plated uh, brass, looks like gold, and so forth. You know, but that's that's my preference. And I tell you, the plating I use, or the guy who does my plating, he does showroom chrome or showroom plate. The plating costs more than the drum. Wow! <laughs> but if somebody if somebody wanted that custom plating, and they asked you for, they you could obviously do it for them. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah, they, it, they pay the cost, you know. Right. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't charge anything on top of that because it's expensive enough. You right. know. What I mean? But if they wanted that, I would, you know, they wouldn't to pay for it. I'd bring it to my man, and he, and he, and he, he takes pride in his work. You know. I meant to ask you, uh, maybe Elena asked this uh, previously. What year uh, did you make your first drum, and who was your first customer? The first person I ever purchased one of your drums. First year I started, let me see. Uh, uh, well, the first year, was the first well, to tell you the truth, 
I was with uh, Alex and George Basquez and with Bomba Borinqua. And Alex, when I started, there were, you could count the people who had barriles at that time on the finger of one hand. Maybe about four or five people had drums. Mm -hmm. And uh, Alex was one of them. He had the tunuquetes from uh, Juan Davila. And the bands, the stainless steel bands needed adjustment. They were like, you know, the, the wood shakes and the, the steel expands. And I was looking at his drums and I asked him, I tell him, you know, you need a band adjustment. He says, yeah, I'm looking for somewhere I can do that. I told him, I could do that for you. So I did it because he took me in when I first started playing Bomba, him and George, and took me in and I played with them. So I did that. I adjusted his bands. That's how it started. And uh, then I go to Tato Torres, where they were playing over at Julio de Burgos. And when I go in there to watch him play, Tato calls me over because he saw what I did to Alex. When I this drum and he told me joe you're gonna get a lot of work <laughs> <laughs> and it, it kind of evolved from there I mean, do you know what year that was maybe 2003 three two three around there mm -hmm. 2003 so and, and how I got into the bomba was I was doing the rumba, you know, Boys Harbor with the rumberos and all these guys. And I asked a friend of mine, I said, you know, I'm looking for a venue where I can learn bomba and plan. So he took me to Tito Cepeda's mm. and over at the top houses. And I was it. I went there and the rest is history. <laughs> Fantastic. Wow. So we have a question from Ricardo. Ricardo asked Norca and Joe. Can you talk a little bit about the history of Bomba? This is probably a very large question, but maybe you could just give a, just a little bit. Um, can you talk a little bit about the history of Bomba in New York City and the role of New Yorkians in preserving the spread of Bomba in the diaspora? <laughs> um, well, the history, of, particularly in New York City, um, it has a, a long history. There's people that have been doing Bomba um, in New York City, City for a very long time. Um, interestingly enough, um, just like in, just like Joe said, um, a lot of people didn't have uh, barriles, so plena was like the main component um, that moved, uh, you know, a lot of the, the Puerto Ricanness and, and el folclore Puerto Ricano in, in New York City for, for many, many years, and you had to really go out and search and, and, and you know, to kind of like find bomba it was kind of hard. Um, because there were pleneros, you know, practicing plena that were bomberos, you know, that came from bomba families or that they play bomba and, and were in New York City and, and you know, they had, uh, you know, access, it was easier access to the plena, um, you know, La Casita de, de Chema uh, con, Jose, um, con Jose Soto Chema is, is a, a, a staple in the community for, for both Plena and Bomba. And for many years, I remember going there, you know, when the area, the casita was not even there, you know, it was just a lot of just, you know, dirt and, and garbage to one side and garbage to the next, you know, and the Bronx was still kind of smelling like smoke, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so the area was, you know, it looked like a war zone and, and you know, uh, um, and Chema, you know, cleaned it out and, and funny enough, the, the place, they used to call it uh, Villa Cuernos, um, you know, and um, eventually, you know, and you can hear Plena there, you know, and then eventually, you know, you, you have people that, you know, apareció un barril y aparece el otro, and then this was a place where you can go and literally, you know, uh, find bomba for sure, for sure. Um, you really didn't see it outside of ese gremio ahí de, de la casita de Chema, at least from my experience. And I'm talking about, you know, uh, the early days of la casita from before, um, you know, it kind of uh, was the, the structure was there. What time, um, what time and, period you know, are we talking about? What time period? What years? Yes. Oh, wow, we were talking about the 80s. You know, that, that whole area wasn't even developed at the time. Or the, the buildings were torn down. Um, that street where the casita stands on now was not the original place. 
Um, is, so if you go to La Casita de Chema, the, the, the park next to it, and then the block after is a tall, big building, brown building. That's what La Casita de Chema originally was. And all of that, none of that was there. Um, the development across the street, um, El Precinto, see, you know, the old Corabachi uh, 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 was there, where, the area with um, Bronx community, uh, not Bronx community, uh, Boricua College, none of that was there, you know. Um, but you could still go there. They have people, you know, haciendo al capurria, bacalaito, and you hear the, the you hear the the, the bomba. Um, but it was very minimal. And again, you had to go to these different spots to kind of like hear, you know, Boricuas doing, you know, their, their music from home. Um, oh, in los fines de semana, because really you hardly hear, heard it. You know, you had the festivals in New York City where they catered more to the mainstream music. So you heard a lot of the, you know, the merengue, you heard a lot of the salsa, but, you know, and equally in Puerto Rico too, you know, you heard, you hardly heard bomba uh in any mainstream you know um places tv or or anywhere else in festival until recently um but i would say that um for me um bomba en plena has always been practiced in new york city since the early you know people that started coming in and, and coming to to new york and el que venían como le decían emigrado you know to to new york and then to come and work you know uh, orchards here in the, the tri-state area, Rhode Island, Connecticut, all of that stuff. Um, so Plena has always been a, um, played in, in New York City. However, I think that a catalyst of where people started really looking at Bomba as, as, as oh my God, esto existe, this exists, um, is when Banco Popular does uh, the special Raices, that's um, 2004. And then, you know, people are like, oh my God, what is this? What is this? What is this? What is this? And it becomes, you know, like, este resurgimiento de bomba and people start to get interested and then it, it evolves and starts to get the, 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 the light that it has today. I don't think that it would have had much interest from anyone had it not been for that specific um, special and this is my my specific opinion. Do you um, think that the Bon Plenazo, um through Ostos that was started like through folks at Ostos, Wally and Roberta Wally Edgecombe, Roberta Singer and with, with people from the La Casita and Los Pleneros, do you think like the Bon Plenazo, which is going on twenty years, had a hand in that too? Because that brings yeah that brings musicians from the island, from all from from the West Coast, from Texas, from Chicago, all here and makes like this New York a center. Of yeah, the yeah, I, I believe, I believe so. I, I think that, you know, um, the, the Bon Plenazo, uh, you know, event is also responsible for, for the resurgence of Bomba in New York. And, and I have to say, New York Bomba is a special kind of Bomba. You know, it's not like Puerto Rico Bomba. It's not like Chicago bomba. It's not like Florida bomba. All these other places in the diaspora have their bomba because there are people practicing it, you know. Um, however, you can tell New York bomba when you hear it. You have the players, you know. You have the people that that when they get together, you know. And we're so raw and in your face, you know. And, and we're hard about it. And 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 I love New York bomba. It's, it has a special place in my heart, not only because I'm from New York, but um, I'm I'm. I'm a lover to the drum and all its shapes, ways, and forms and sound. And New York Bomba to me is it's is as hardcore as it gets. The sound will grab you and will not let you go. Gangsta Bomba, yeah. Yes. Well, <laughs> we, just have a, we have a couple more questions. And speaking of these sort of like drum gatherings and how important they were, Luis Perez wanted to ask Joe, do you remember the Roombas in Brownsville back in the 1970s? The rumba in Brownsville. I come from Brownsville. I used to live in Rockwell, Livonia. <laughs> but the first time I heard the rumbas were basically uh, in, when I worked the South Bronx. That was in the early 70s. And uh, they used to have them down there by uh, where the buses make the turn, right off Simpson Street and Westchester and Southern Boulevard and whatnot. And then Central Park rumba, you know what I mean? And whatnot. So, St. Mary's Park, yeah, St. Mary's Park. 
Yeah. When we're talking, about, for those of you who are watching, when we're talking about rumba, we're talking about uh, a style of Cuban music that involves drumming, dancing, and vocals. This conga involves drumming, dancing, and vocals, but it uses conga drums. And we're basically talking about which is Havana style, and which is Matanza style. And that was what we played as Puerto Ricans growing up in New York City. I mean, I must say that when we play, ask me, people ask me all the time, what is salsa? I always say salsa is simply Cuban music played with a freaking New York Rican attitude, which is what Norica talks about it. And you can tell what, when we play salsa, the aggressiveness, et cetera, that the, the you know, the street, la calle, the, it, as the, as the old saying, la calle está durísima, the street is hard and that, gets transferred into the soul of the people and the soul of the music. So what Joe is talking about is what we grew up with. And I must say, me and Elena one time we were at Orchard Beach and you, Orchard Beach in the Bronx is, uh, you know, you'd hear Cuban rumba played by Puerto Ricans all the time. And one time we were at Orchard Beach and all of a sudden I'm hearing, it. I go, I, I don't believe it. There's people playing barriles, de bomba, in Orchard Beach. And we go over and we see some of our brethren playing. And I told them, you know how deep this is? I thought I never would see this at Orchard Beach. Uh, so it just shows you how, finally, through the efforts of you three, uh, how our, our, Puerto Rican, our Puerto Rican musical heritage is finally affirming itself here in the city where we've always been purveyors of Cuban music. That has to be said, if it wasn't for Puerto Ricanos, there would be no Cuban music in New York or in the United States for that matter. Okay. We helped preserve it. Kept it alive. Right. Yeah, we kept it alive, but now we're keeping our own culture alive as well. So, it, it, so we just have, all three of you, you know? We just have two more questions and we can start wrapping up. Um, Bob Ramos asked a question, which actually you talked a little bit at the very beginning, but maybe um, Joe can just repeat this a little bit. Um, Bob Ramos asked, what are the correct measurements for the bomba drum? Like the correct, but you talked a little bit about there's like various measurements and how tall are the drum should be, what are the dimensions? And I guess maybe for the, the two different types of, of bariles. So I know we talked a little bit about that earlier, but maybe if you can just repeat a little bit about that. The sizes, uh, the ideal to me, the ideal bomba drum, which to me, it would be uh, 24 inch height, and 14 inch diameter. To me, that's the Swiss army knife of bomba drums or barriles. You tune it up, you got a primo, you tune it down, you have a bullador. You put a nice medium thick skin on it and it's, it's you're good to go. So that's, to me, that's the all around drum. You know Great. One last question. Um, Elena Mavarazzi Marrero asked, Joe, can you discuss the workshop you did at El Fogón, where you guys are right now, where you taught, um, where you, you showed how to make mini body lace? When we did the kids. Oh, yeah, we did, uh, we had two sessions of, well, two, two sessions ten of, se ten, ten sessions, ten of sessions each, but we had two class, uh, two semesters of uh, bomba making, body making 101 where I had uh, these small barrels, uh, pine barrels, and we, we made many drums out of them. And basically the process to making those barrels would be the same if you had a large barrel. Right? And for me, if, if you're looking to make a barrel or make a bari, try and get a 16 gallon drum, you know, a 16 gallon oak barrel. That would be the perfect size, perfect height, It'd be 14, 15 inch diameter. You know, if you want to make it a little smaller, you pull out one of the stays, you could drop it down to a 14 inch. So if you look for a 16 gallon barrel, that would be a perfect size for you. But Maybe then so. again, I had somebody get a 16 gallon barrel, but it was it was fatter and shorter. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you got to watch what you get. <laughs> Joe, I meant to ask you this, from start to finish, you know, if you were working on the drum every day to make it, how long would it take to make one beautiful? It takes that everybody would be proud of to own. 
Yeah, well, it takes me when I started, it took me about, uh, about 40 hours, but now I did some new enhancements on them that I do. So now it takes me about 45, 50 hours, depending, I mean, but that's what it takes. Now, it also depends on the weather because the weather will affect it. Cold weather, uh, you know, I try not to do anything in the cold weather because it's just a pain in the neck. You know, it, it, the, the humidity, the coldness and, you know. So when, I just, gonna, when, when it gets cold, are you gonna be on a little vacation then from drumming? Well, no, I, I close it down and we pick up in the spring and I go to my winter projects, you know what I mean? But I'll do repairs. People come in, wanna convert their rope drums to metal drums. You know, I can work the metal in the winter, you know what I mean? But not the woodwork or gluing or glassing or anything like that. Can you talk a little bit about that, Norka, the different old school style of the tourniquetes and all that kind of thing? The, the... Yeah, it's funny because I just something popped into my in my head. Um, um, yeah, it's like more of a, of a, a you know, a public service announcement um, <laughs> <laughs> for everyone watching and for the people watching to tell other people. Um, Bomba Works doesn't make uh, mass, you know, we don't mass produce drums, right? It takes Joe is saying, you know, he's being extremely modest when he says 40 hours, 50 hours. Um, the amount of work and the, 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 the eye for detail in each and every single drum that comes out of the Bomba work workshops, um, it's, it's, it's work that is guaranteed, right? We've had drums from a lot of other different makers from New York, the different different makers here in, in New York City and, and, and the, the, the diaspora, as well as Puerto Rico, come through the shop for repairs, um, you know, revisions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and when people that do not have a drum that are coming into Bomba for the first time that maybe play other instrument, conga, whatever, um, you know, there are different tuning systems. Traditionally, we have the cuña drum, which is like a wedge, similar to a wedge that you put under a door to make a stop. Um, around the, 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 the diameter of the drum holding down, and that's what holds down the skin. You have to hammer that down in order to make the skin stretch and make it sound to the tonality that you want to. That's cuña. Then you have the torniquete drum, which is a roping system. Um, you know, there's some holes made out, made, made throughout the, um, the body and the shell, uh, the barrel itself. Rope goes through um, in a specific way, and then there are some sticks similar, a little bit shorter than the quad sticks that are um, inserted into the to the into the rope. And then you know you have to be extremely precise with the cuña as well as with the tourniquete, which is a tourniquet tuning system. Because if you don't know how to tune, if you don't know how to tune a regular drum with cancamos with the hooks, you have no business. <laughs> Tuning the other drums. You know, I have known people that have drums uh, made out of the tuning system torniquete, and they take out all this the sticks out, and then they don't know how to put it back together. Um, so um, it's better to own a, a a drum that you can tune um, with the cancamos with the hooks. It's more modern, easier to handle. You can count the many ways you tune it up so that the skin doesn't shift on you and slips out of the, the drum itself. Um, and also um, the one thing that I also wanted to say that has nothing to do with the tuning system and the, the difference um, of, um, of tuning system is that um, think when you buy, when you go to a drum maker, an artisan, they're not only drum makers, they're, they're artisans, right? This is an art. You're not being mass produced. You have LP that mass produces drums Bomba drums in recent times, they just put out a drum. You want those drums? You could go get that, those drums. You want Cinco Dedos? You can contact Cinco Dedos and get drums from them. But when you come to Bomba Works or any other artisan that is making drums, hear this and please remember this. Do not haggle them down. Do not lowball them because this is detailed work that is hands on. In, in, in Bomba Works case, tools are being made in order to facilitate the work that goes out, you know, and the work again is guaranteed. So if a, a price is set for you to buy a drum, you buy it at that price because everybody likes quality, but not necessarily pay for the quality. 
you know, it's important that we preserve our history, our traditions. And if you are disrespecting an artisan by lowballing their prices, because they take time, you know, Joe's not going to say this, but I wanted to say it because it's important. Um, you know, it's important that we preserve um, and, and respect the work. You know, you don't go into LP, you don't go into, you know, Toca and all these other places and haggle their prices. You see a conga, you see a super tumbadora, a Giovanni Hidalgo model, a galaxy, and you pay the 600, the 800, whatever it is, you pay for it. So when these artisans come and do a display in whatever festival and have a beautiful drum that you want, they say a price, pay it, pay it. So the lesson of the day is no sand duro, you know. <laughs> Ponte duro, you know. <laughs> well, Norca, I want to thank you for saying that because that's sort of like the reason this this apprenticeship exists, right? In that there is to make handmade quality craftsmanship. We live in a world where we can buy, we can find a lot of the things, a lot of these things sometimes made um, in other ways or mass produced. But the point of having traditions like this is that we can help keep them going forward and keep them alive by um, having folks like you and Joe who are masters at this work, but also having um, people like George and Nelson take part so they can keep this tradition going. Cause you know, there's not as many people who are doing this and handmade um, great craftsmanship um, to keep these traditions alive. And with that, um, I want to thank everyone who was watching today. Um, we want to thank George, Joe, and Norca, and Nelson for um, all the work they did this past year on, the, on, 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 this, on this apprenticeship and for the, 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 you know, the music and everything they brought today. And um, also, and we also just want to thank NISCA, of course, the New York State Council of the Arts for providing these apprenticeship, um, this apprenticeship program. City Lore, the Joe and um, Nelson was through City Lore, Norca and George was through the Bronx Music Heritage Center. So we hope that we can work with more artists in the future like this. And um, we also have to give a major shout out to Jorge Vasquez, another drummer who's worked a lot with the folks here today. And he's also been working triple duty all week for the South Bronx Folk Festival, for for the Bronx Music Heritage Center, doing his own work, and he made all this technical stuff happen today. So a big shout out to Jorge Vasquez. Big round of applause, everyone. And he's also a master drummer in the traditions of bomba and plan. Yeah, so. so we and we just want to let you know um, tomorrow. Come back to Facebook. We have our open mic, our sort of bi month. Every other month, I don't know what you call it. Every other month, Palabriando, hosted by Chris Belli from the Bronx, Lyrical, Bricks, R Lyrical Bliss from the Bronx, and Boca Floja from the Bronx via Mexico. And next week, we have our series, Music by the Book, which since Puerto Rican Heritage Month, we're going to have the author Ernesto Acevedo Munoz, who wrote the book West Side Story as Cinema. We're going to prepare for the new remake by Steven Spielberg of West Side Story that comes out in a few weeks. And we're going to talk to Ernesto about his book and um, how he analyzed the original West Side Story movie. So that's next um, Wednesday, right before the holidays. So everyone, thank you so much. Um, I want to, again, a big round of applause for George, Joe, and Norca. And um, we'll see you back on our Facebook page next week. Good night. Bye. Bye. Buenas noches. Bye. Peace. <laughs>